Good morning. Let the church say amen. Let the church say amen one more time. Welcome to First Baptist Church, North Indianapolis, where we give God all the praise and we give God all the glory. It's time to get started with our service and with our devotion. And let's have a hallelujah good time. Let's lift him up and let's praise his name. So at this time, may we bow our heads in a word of prayer. Father God in heaven, we thank you, great master. Heavenly Father, we thank you for last night's lying down. And we thank you for this morning's early rising. We thank you for being God and being God all by yourself. Great master, bless our service that you receive all the praise and that you receive all the glory. Bless our pastor who's coming with your uncompromising word, leading God and that someone may come forth and ask, what must I do to be saved? Your mind regulated today, your heart fixed today, and we thank you for that, great master. Great master, we thank you for your loving kindness. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your long suffering. We thank you for your Holy Spirit that dwells upon us. But most of all, great master, we thank you for Jesus, that lily in the valley, that rock, that bright and morning star, our savior who died, Mary's little baby. But on the third day, you got him up and claimed all power, not any power, but all power of heaven and earth in his hands. We love you, we glorify you, we magnify you. We ask that you forgive us of all of our sins. 
Bless our church as a whole. We ask all of these blessings in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Church. This is Rick and Kim Driscoll. How are you? We're so blessed that you're part of our world, and I want to turn it over to my lovely wife to say hello. I just wanted to say that I appreciate 
First Baptist so much and love the preaching and the teaching and the testimonies and just the power of the Holy Spirit that works through all of you and reaches those of us who are listening um, in our homes or far away. So I just um, love you very much. I feel blessed um, and privileged to join you every Wednesday. Um, and I just pray that God blesses each and every one of you uh, with all your heart's desires and meets your needs and provides and comforts you and um, just is with you. Uh, he works through you and in you and we love you and we're, again, so blessed to be part of your family. And enjoy your Sunday, your Lord's Day. What a glorious day it is. I'm so grateful that I got a chance to meet Pastor Jerome on a business call. Praise God that he put us together because because of that business call, we are now brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen. We love you all and have a wonderful Sunday. Love you. Bye. We praise God on today that we have an opportunity to worship and to glorify our God. On today, we want to share with you some announcements that should come before you. We are looking forward to the beginning of our NIA Academy that will take place on the 18th of April uh, at 6 p.m. It will continue to be uh, by way of Zoom. Uh, but even as we're looking forward to that, there are some things that are about to take place in the sanctuary of First Baptist Church, North Indianapolis, and in our Bradley building. Uh, we've asked that our prayer warriors would begin to come back into the Bradley building to pray. Uh, ministers even on this Sunday are making their way to the sanctuary that they might pray. Uh, we're going to consecrate that sanctuary and ourselves. And then on the first Sunday of April, on April the 3rd, uh, we're asking that all leaders, you may self-define as a leader and bring your families. We're asking that uh, you might bring uh, the appropriate attitude and a spirit uh, of worship and that you might prepare as well to consecrate ourselves as we are pressing our way toward Resurrection Sunday. Uh, so the first Sunday in April, all leaders, the second Sunday, the 10th, uh, we're going to ask that all of the members of the congregation uh, in our community that uh, First Baptist would be there once again, as we prepare, as we consecrate ourselves, as we pray that God might bless us as we come back in uh, to our sanctuary after two years uh, in the wilderness, two years of being away. Uh, we're looking forward to that, uh, that second Sunday. All of the members of our congregation and community are invited. And then whosoever will, let them come on Resurrection Sunday morning, the 17th. We will be at First Baptist Church, North Indianapolis. Uh, we are going to have a uh, an 11:15 service. 11:15, we'll get going with our praise team uh, at 11:15, and we will have a brief service. But uh, we're looking forward to you being with us. Uh, we are going to immediately clear the sanctuary after service, uh, but we may feel free to fellowship outside. Uh, but as well, we'll provide a little water and the Bradley Education Building in our skylight room. Uh, so that uh, you can have an opportunity, even if the weather is inclement, to meet and to greet one another uh, in the Bradley building, a more cavernous space with air moving. Uh, but while on our campus, uh, the requirement still remains uh, that we wear a mask, uh, that we might uh, protect everyone. Uh, it is not lost on me that all of our members and all of those that will be coming to our facilities and participating in worship experiences and prayer uh, and classes at First Baptist. It is not uh, our notion that everyone is vaccinated, uh, that everyone has that protection. And so we still must wear masks, uh, that we have an opportunity to keep everyone safe. Uh, that's been our mantra down through these two years. We've done everything we can do to provide education and information from doctors. And uh, we've provided guidance and advice as we have dealt and continue to deal with the pandemic moving into endemic. Uh, proportions, uh, but we will continue to keep you safe. We'll continue to make decisions, um, even with the protocols and procedures uh, that our congregation uh, in our New Frontier initiative, uh, we came up with protocols and procedures and we praise God for 
uh, George and Marcella Armstrong and that interior committee, as well as Eric Cheatham and our Board of Christian Education, uh, Dr. Edward Lorenzo Wheeler, of uh, those uh, that were here and abroad that uh, continue to look at the exterior, how we're going to continue to provide streaming uh, for those that are outside of Indianapolis, Indiana. But look, even for those that are inside, there are members of First Baptist Church that are shown enough good members uh, that have determined that because of health conditions or because they've become accustomed to uh, the worship experiences provided by way of stream, uh, they've decided that uh, their, uh, their participation in in-service worship will be limited. Um, and so we want to continue to provide for our members. Uh, we want to continue to evangelize, realizing uh, that our church has grown uh, during this time. And we now have members uh, that are in new members training classes far away uh, from uh, Cape Town, South Africa. We have consistent worshipers in Uganda. And uh, we have, as you heard earlier today in this stream, uh, people that have galvan that have gathered uh, and have been drawn to us and to our ministry uh, from New Hampshire. And uh, my cousin Chucky is on the other side of the world somewhere trying to restore democracy, but he chimes in and classmates and childhood friends and your friends and, and persons that you have witnessed to and evangelized. We still have an opportunity uh, to push them to our stream. Uh, and we encourage you uh, as well to continue to uh, participate into worship in every way and any way you can and continue to reach out uh, to those that uh, are seeking a better or a greater relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Let them know that they can join the church. Uh, we as well invite you to give. Uh, it is our time to give. We are a tithing church uh, because the word of God teaches tithing. Our obedience to God requires tithing. So let's bring our tithes and offerings unto the Lord as he has prospered us, because the word says the tenth shall be holy unto the Lord. Uh, we ask that you might go to firstbaptistnorth.org, our website. There you will find Zelle and Givelify and PayPal. We ask that you might send your tithes and your offerings, your donations, your contributions. Uh, if you cannot utilize Zelle, Givelify, and PayPal, just put it in snail mail and send it to that address. We have secure boxes that allow for us an opportunity uh, to uh, receive your tithes and your offerings in a safe way. We praise God for your faithfulness, First Baptist Church in our community. We encourage you to continue to give and continue to support the ministries of First Baptist Church, North Indianapolis. Uh, let's look forward as well to the 12th of April. On the 12th of April, that's a Tuesday, we're asking that all of our young people, our youth fellowship be here. Uh, Steve Grant and uh, Brother McElroy, they are uh, Indianapolis Colts, uh, and they will be with us uh, providing a message that talks about sports and talks about uh, competition, uh, but uh, most importantly, talks about the relationship our young people need to have with God through Jesus Christ. And this is our young people's first opportunity to get back into the into the sanctuary as a youth fellowship. And so we're looking forward to that day. Look, Sunday school is gonna get going the first week of April as well. So that while we're coming back into the sanctuary in the Bradley building at 10 o'clock, uh, we will have Sunday school and we praise God for Marguerite Watkins, our superintendent of instruction, our superintendent of Sunday school, uh, who has been diligent and faithful every Thursday. She records for stream and we play the stream at 10 o'clock on Sunday. Once again, we'll continue to do those things, but uh, we're looking forward to 10 o'clock at the Bradley Education Building uh, on the 3rd of April for our first Sunday school opportunity. Uh, there will be Sunday school provided uh, for young people as uh, young as two uh, and uh, as old as you want to go. So we're looking to accommodate and to provide Sunday school instruction for the entire family. Please come and be with us at 10 o'clock on Sunday mornings. But we want to uh, turn your attention to this sick list that is before us. Uh, we want to list the names of people that are going through hours of bereavement. Uh, you can find the entire list on your uh, on your website, firstbaptistnorth.org. That website is that is before you. You can find the entire list as we uh, go to God in prayer for uh, the persons that we have listed here. <clears throat> Virginia Carson, Shirley Madden, Ashley Murphy, Andrea Parham, Valley Zellers and her family, Leslie Coyle, Pat Burks, Bill Johnson and his family, 
uh, Deanne Miller, Dorcas Craven, Dorothy Taylor, Larry Shores, Lenny Harris, Marzilia Broadnax, Nicole Bowman, Jesse Level, Andrew Brownlee, her family, his family, Wanda Robinson, Sheila Ray, John McCrary, uh, Charles Lockmeyer, Willie Frank Dangerfield, Tracy Carson, Sherry Garvin Johnson, Holden Moore, Kamara Cavanaugh, Noah Henry, Sylvia Brinkley, Jason Daughtry, Theron Bennett, Jovan Barker, Marie Highball, Craig Moore, David Holt, Charles Price, Jan Janine Dillard, Marcella Armstrong, Francis Watson, Jarda Cook, John Rogan, Regina Green, uh, Nisha Beverly, Dave Berker, Shonda Wilson, Joyce Wilkins. I uh, uh, want you to continue to lift up uh, Betty Harrington, Christina Tringali, uh, Sheila Stiles and her family, the Doucet family, Duane Eccles Jr., the Dubner family, Kevin Bakeman, Diane Taylor, Ryan Carter, Tasha Jones, William Tinsley, Charles Robinson, Lashana Tutson, Luantha Harris, Sher Sherry Cooper, Linda Thomas, Jackie Brooks, Ronald Rutland, Helen Williams, Susan Bowman, Mary Jacqueline McCain, Shirley Williams, Langston Wilson, Stacy Farr, Bertha Knapper, Crystal and Anthony Abram, Rosalind Cole, uh, Renate Stenke, uh, Michelin Freeman, James Crow, Nancy Thurman, Ethel Estes, uh, Mary Lala, John William White, Greg White, uh, Donald Tut, Leandra Radford, Laura Henderson, uh, Keith Hayes, uh, Donna Coleman and her family, Patty Holt, Linnell Beatty, I pray for uh, Andy Krim that he might continue to recuperate. Uh, we want to lift up uh, my father, Dr. H. Beecher Hicks, and continue to lift him. Uh, we want to pray for Sister Danny Motley and that entire Motley family and the loss of her mother. Uh, that service of celebration was this last Thursday. Uh, and so we pray for the entire family of Iris Ollinger, uh, Sister Danny Motley's mother. Uh, we pray for <clears throat> pray for Minister uh, Michelle Fisher Jones and the loss of uh, their brother-in-law Mike Cuffey. Uh, we pray for Deacon Arthur Allen and loss of his cousin uh, Eric Bickerstaff. We continue to uh, lift them up, and let's continue to pray for. Our ministries at First Baptist Church, we've already mentioned so much that we are doing. Uh, we do encourage as well uh, members to continue to participate uh, in our couples ministry uh, that will take place on first on the first uh, Sunday at 5 p.m. We're looking forward to our couples ministry at that time. Uh, we're going to ask right now that you might prepare yourself uh, to go to God in prayer and Deacon Neil Jameson is going to come. And as he comes to lead us, we ask that uh, you might uh, reverence yourself, place the names of persons uh, that stand in need of prayer uh, in our chat category, uh, in your comment category, that we might lift them as well. Uh, there are situations that are brewing all over this world. Uh, not only is there a war between Russia and China and Ukraine that is uh, brewing right now, but uh, there's another sub-variant even of uh, Omicron uh, that uh, is uh, noticed now in the United States, but has uh, the UK and places in China, Australia, uh, shutting down much like we did a couple of years ago. And so we pray that we might continue to do those things that are safe and that we might continue to pray for uh, God's blessing and guidance. Uh, the word says in 2 Chronicles 7.14, if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. The promise is that God will hear us all the way from heaven. He'll forgive our sin and he'll heal our land. Let's go to God in prayer. Let us pray, dear Father. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you in prayer. We've come to you in so much need, Prophet. We have the sick and we have the study in there, Father. Help us as we go through our problems. 
Heavenly Father, here we are today, this Sunday, coming to you in prayer for the sick and the shutting. Touch their hearts, touch their minds. Just give them peace, dear Father. Give peace to the ones that's in the nursing homes, the hospitals, and the ones that's sitting in a home sick, dear Father. Touch our man and body as we go through this dear father be like the woman that touched the hem of his dress hem of your coat and and she was immediately healed and the woman that came to you and said my daughter needs help there and you healed her from there touch just give us a healing process that we need this whole world need a healing process, need love, and give them love, and make the love come from inside and out. Dear Father, you are the healer. You are the Jehovah. You sit high, and we sit low, waiting on your healing, dear Father. I ask this of all, dear Father. Bless us all. Bless the churches that's going through. Bless people that's going through. Bless the Russians and Ukraine that's going through. It's a healing that we to done over there, their father. They love each other, but one person is ruling. And touch that ruler and give him a soft heart. Make his heart soft. Dear Father, just love on us as you always have. And we will be there to love you back and worship you and praise you, dear Father. Oh, Father, you are just the Almighty and the only one Almighty. I ask this in the name of your Son, God. Let us all say.
Wanna say I love you more than anything Yeah, yeah I love Jesus I worship and adore you Ooh, I wanna tell you Lord, I love you more than anything yeah, 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 I love you, Jesus. I worship and adore you. I want to tell you, Lord, I love you more than anything. Yeah. sisters of Jesus Christ. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Look, if you have your Bibles with you, if you would pick them up, your phone, whatever you use, please pick it up and let us uh, make our way to the book of Acts, the letter of Acts 19, Le Acts 19. From the New King James Version of the Bible this morning, we will be reading Acts 19 verses 11 through 20. And this is what it says as you listen intently. It says, beginning at verse 11, now God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul so that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick and the diseases left them and the evil spirits went out of them. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits saying, we exercise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. Also, there were seven sons of Siva, a Jewish chief priest who did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus, I know, and Paul, I know, but who are you? Then the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped upon them, overpowered them, and prevailed against them, so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. This became known both to all Jews and Greeks dwelling in Ephesus, and fear fell on them all. 
and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified, and many who had believed came confessing and telling their deeds. Also, many of those who had practiced magic brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted up the value of them and it totaled 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. Amen, amen. I wanna preach this morning from the subject, does the enemy know your name? Go ahead and put that in the atmosphere. Does the enemy know your name? Let's pray. Father God, I thank you right now, Lord. I'm asking, Lord, that you might remove Jerome, Father God, so that this waiting host might hear the words that the Spirit would have them hear, and that lives might be changed, eyes might be opened, Father God, ears become unclogged, and hearts might be open to your word. Thank you, Father God. We bless your name right now. In the mighty, matchless name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray and ask it all. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Does the enemy know your name? Let, let's find out. As an examination of this text, we'll answer this and other questions regarding how the enemy feels about you and your faith. I'm going to time travel. I'm going to time travel often from antiquity to the present. In this text from antiquity, we find Paul in Ephesus. Please let me try to explain the mood of Ephesus. And it might not be a stretch to say modern day America. Oh Lord, Ephesus was a hotbed of magic, sorcery and witchcraft and was gaining believers. Here in modern day America, we might be desensitized to it, but we can find that these are the things that are popular on TV, social media, and even in the music we listen to. In Ephesus, Paul's teaching and preaching are so powerful that the faith of the people grows so much that God is able to do special miracles through Paul. Verse 12 says that so that from uh, his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons and, and the diseases departed from them and the evil spirits went out of them. That's power, brothers and sisters. And I want you to notice something important here about Paul, his ministry and commitment. Every day for two years and three months, Paul taught the people, the word of God. The Bible says that faith comes when we hear the word of God. And because Paul faithfully taught the word, the faith of the people grew so much that it gave God the avenue he needed to release miracles in their midst. Faith moves God. He cannot and will not move in our lives without faith. The Bible says, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Ephesus, Ephesus, Ephesus is a breeding ground for magic, sorcery, and witchcraft. It was a stronghold of the enemy. And according to our text, we will see that the enemy knew exactly who the true believers were that he had to watch out for in antiquity. And you know what? Today, he still knows who he needs to watch out for. Yes, the title of the sermon is, Does the Enemy Know Your Name? But the question in this text is, how, how, how does the enemy know your name? If you ask somebody, does the devil know your name? Most might say, I sure hope not. Well, I'm here this morning to suggest to you that you your enemy should know your name. And there are two qualities that will put you on the enemy's radar. One, if you truly believe in the name of Jesus. And two, if you are living in the name of Jesus. Believing in Jesus is what happens on the inside when we understand the difference between head knowledge and heart knowledge. Living in Jesus is revealed on the outside. Believing in Jesus and having a personal relationship with Jesus is what transforms a person into a public lifestyle of living in Jesus. We cannot live for Jesus until we truly believe Jesus. Let me reiterate, there are two ways in which the enemy will know your name. And the first is, if you believe in the name of Jesus, the enemy will know your name. Mm. 
verses 11 through 12 lets us know that God was doing unusual miracles by the hands of Paul. Paul was doing some extraordinary miracles and these miracles were not a result of any power that Paul had, but by the power he found by truly believing in the name of Jesus. The people with diseases were cured. Those suffering from mental disorders were restored. The blind were made to see. The, the crippled were walking. The, the deaf were given new ears. The, the mute received a voice. And in this cesspool of sorcery and witchcraft, Paul shows up preaching and believing in Jesus. But his belief was more than simple belief in facts about Jesus. I believe it's James that says that in 2 and 19 that you say that you have faith for you believe there is one God. Good for you. Good for you. Even the demons believe this and they tremble in terror. However, the name of Jesus meant something to Paul because Paul had a life-changing experience with Jesus Christ. And for those who have not had that life-changing relationship, sometimes they just want some praise and some notoriety. They want their 15 minutes of fame. They are not happy serving uh, behind the scenes, but they need to be in the limelight looking good for everybody to see. The seven sons of Siva had this attitude and were like this. The text tells us that after God performs uh, the special miracles, copycats begin to try to demonstrate their power over evil spirits using the name of Jesus. This band of brothers, the Siva brothers, went out, went into business uh, casting out weaker demons using the names of stronger demons, and business was good. However, they wanted to improve and grow the business. And so they noticed what Paul was doing. Thus, they decided that they would begin to do some of these extraordinary things that Paul was doing by the power of the name of Jesus. And on this communion day morning, let us allow these brothers to educate us thousands of years later as a prime example of what not to do. This is free. If God is not in it, stay out of it. If God didn't call you, don't you answer. Notice what happened when, when they tried something they, they had no business dealing with. Verse 13 through 16 says, uh, then some of the itinerant uh, Jewish exorcists took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits. This is what they were saying. We exorcise you by this Jesus whom Paul preaches. Also, there were seven, seven sons of Siva, a Jewish chief priest who did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus, I know. And Paul, I know. But who are you? Then the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, overpowered them and prevailed against them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. What in the world happened? Here's the problem, my brothers and sisters, with what they were doing. They did not say, in the name of Jesus, whom we preach. They did not say, in the name of Jesus, whom we believe. They said, in the name of this Jesus, whom Paul preaches. They were thinking that he's not our Jesus, but if it works for Paul, We'll give it a try. Don't miss this in the text. When they tried to cast out the spirit using a name, it wasn't the name of their daddy, Siva. Somebody ought to text that. He was a preacher, but evidently they didn't have any faith in their daddy. They said in the name of this Jesus whom Paul preaches. We can say with confidence that the sons of Siva did not have the right to use the name of Jesus because they had no real personal connection to him. In the same pattern, there are many people, including Bible-toting uh, Bible uh, churchgoers, 
who will perish in hell because they have no personal relationship with Jesus Christ. They're carrying the Bible, but they're not reading the Bible. There's a cross hanging on their necks, but Jesus is not on the cross anymore. They only know the Jesus whom the pastor preaches or the Jesus my spouse believes in instead of the Jesus of their own salvation. Brothers and sisters, this word challenges us to perform some critical introspection. Ask yourself, do you have the right to use the name? These seven sons of the high priest saw the things that Paul was doing in the name of Jesus. And they figured it all had something to do with the mere mention of that name. There are many who believe that they can do what anybody else can do and quite likely do it better. However, when you decide to take on a spiritual task without having Jesus Christ and the Spirit of God in your life and in the task, you are taking on a spiritual enemy with your physical strength. And that can have tragic consequences because your enemy knows you. The word of God says that out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. In other words, people and your enemy can listen to what you say and discover what's in your heart. That's why we better pray. That's why ministers will gather at First Baptist Church North Indianapolis in just a little while to consecrate ourselves and the grounds to our Lord and Savior. As for, C as for the Seba boys, if the name of Jesus had meant as much to them as it did to Paul, then they would have been performing miracles like Paul did. Let, let's, let's time travel because this brings me to a concern. Even as we prepare to re-enter the sanctuary, the revelation in this word ha has caused me to stop in my tracks, reflect and inspect this question. How many times do we or have we prayed in Jesus' name? Like this is some magical phrase that's supposed to make things happen. We usually end our prayers in the name of Jesus. But I wonder if sometimes that's nothing more than a tag at the end of our prayers because that's how we were taught to close a prayer. Without the faith, the power, the belief, and the authority behind the statement is nothing more than sincerely yours that we would put at the end of a letter. Do we really mean it? Or is it simply the way we've been taught to close a letter? The sons of the high priest were calling on someone they didn't believe in and expecting his support of their efforts. And the real time application for 2022 is that we better wake up. We don't need to re-enter the same way we left. We better pray with power and with boldness and from faith in a risen Savior named Jesus Christ. We better worship in spirit and in truth. Don't you find it odd that people will claim things in Jesus' name, but they don't get any better? There's no healing. Families still fall apart, financial struggles still consume them, and they're still miserable. But they say that well, we, we, we asked in Jesus' name. Isn't that what Jesus said to do? I think we have a tremendous misunderstanding of what in the name of Jesus means. I want you to know this morning that there is supernatural power in the name of Jesus. Uh, Luke tells us that one day Jesus called his disciples together and he gave them power and authority to cast out all demons and to heal all diseases. He could not give that which was not his to give. There is healing in the name of Jesus. Peter and John are proof of this. The book of Acts tells us, the, the letter of Acts tells us that Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Brothers and sisters, there is no name above the name of Jesus. And his name is the name by which we are saved. The, the, the word says that, that nor is there salvation in any other. 
For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Confucius didn't understand it. Buddha's name can't do it. The names of Zeus, Odin, and Apollo don't have the power to save you. In fact, your own works, as good as they may be, will never be able to save you. Church membership won't do you a bit of good come judgment day. Religion never has and never will have the power to save. It's in and through and because of the power of Jesus and only through a personal relationship with Jesus that men might be saved. The name of Jesus means something to those who truly believe and have placed their trust in him. I wish I had somebody this morning. The demon said, uh, Jesus, I know. And I know Paul, but you, unbeliever, I don't know. And, and there are two Greek words uh, uh, for no in this text. When the demon said, I know Jesus, he really meant that I really know Jesus. When he said that I know Paul, he really meant I've heard of Paul. The problem for the Siva boys was that he told them, I don't know you. Mm. Because the Siva boys had no real relationship with Jesus. It meant that they had no spiritual power against the evil spirit. The sons of the high priest were calling on somebody they didn't believe in and still expecting his support. The text says that they fled the encounter broken, naked, bleeding, and wounded. And it was dangerous for them to take the reality of spiritual warfare lightly, or lightly. And you know what? It is likewise dangerous for us to take spiritual warfare lightly. You've heard pastor preach it. We do not fight against flesh and blood. And we need to stop taking spiritual warfare lightly and start recognizing it for what it is. When the name of Jesus is spoken in authority, the enemy will tremble. Marriages will be restored. The sick will be healed. Comfort will be given to the hurting. Strength to the weak. Churches will be built. People will be saved. This community and our nation will experience spiritual awakening like never before and revival will come. The enemy knows those by name who truly believe in the name of Jesus. But you know what? The second way the enemy will know your name is if you live in the name of Jesus. The devil did not always know Paul because he didn't live in Jesus's name. You see, at first, before his change came, Paul was all about killing believers and closing churches for a living. So he was no threat to the devil, but something happened. Acts tells us that as he was nearing Damascus, he, he had a life-changing encounter with the risen Jesus. And Paul was never the same again after he met Jesus face to face. I wish we had some of those never the same again Christians because I'm sick of the ones we got. Have you ever met him face to face or have you just heard about him from somebody else? I'm talking about a real life changing experience. One that makes you say I'm all in or not in at all. Paul went from being an enemy of God to a friend and servant of God. Paul was all in. Paul said, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me and the life which I live now in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul was living for Jesus. He was in it for the glory of God. While these seven brothers and some of us are in it for the money, the power, the prestige, and the titles. And that's why the demon-possessed man said, Jesus, I know. And Paul, I've heard of, but who are you? Brothers and sisters, what are we really in this for? You better be ready when the enemy asks, who are you? Make no mistake, the moment you have a life-changing encounter with Jesus, the devil is aware of it. I'm talking softly because I want you to get this. 
Those living for Jesus are no longer living for pleasure or power, for greed or money and pride or popularity will no longer be an issue. Does the enemy know your name? This might be the most serious question you've ever been asked. The Bible says in Matthew that uh, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name, did, did we not drive out demons and perform many miracles? He says, then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. This suggests to me that Satan is not the only one who gets mad with people who have no business using the name of Jesus. God also gets mad when somebody uses that name that is above every name without permission and without authority. And there's coming a day when God will tell those folks, I don't know you and you need to get away from me. But don't you worry because Satan will say to those folks, I don't know you either, but you can come and hang out with me. The harsh reality is that if you are not all in, you're not in at all. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Somebody you are in relationship with right now needs to have a life-changing encounter with Jesus today. Don't wait. Jesus said, behold, I stand at the door and knock. All we have to do is open the door and come face to face with the risen Savior and truly believe in the name of Jesus. And once you believe in the name of Jesus, you can begin to live in the name of Jesus. There's too many who claim the name of Jesus, but they're not living in the name of Jesus. Therefore, they don't have permission to use that name. And that's why they're so miserable and defeated. That's why God never answers their prayers. And the devil seems to beat the hell out of them all the time. However, there is some good news that comes out of the beating that the Siva sons took. The good news is that didn't nobody else try that foolishness. The Bible says in verse 17 through 20. This is what it says. It's, it, it says, this became known both to all Jews and Greeks dwelling in Ephesus. They talking about that beating and fear fell on them. And the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. And it says many who had practiced magic brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And it totaled 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord grew mighty and prevailed. Let me tell you something about that. The total amount of magic books and sorcery they had was worth 50,000 pieces of silver. Jesus was sold by Judas for 30 pieces of silver. Let me share with you. In that day, 50,000 pieces of silver was worth about $1 million. Tell somebody anybody, everybody to give their heart, their sin, and their life to Jesus before it's too late. Why not receive the real power that comes from the name of Jesus right now? This then is the end of the thing. The, the sons of Siva thought that because they used the name of Jesus, the evil spirit would obey them. It didn't. The question is why? Brothers and sisters, friends and family, cyberspace, hear this and believe it in your heart. The name of Jesus separated from faith has no power. The name of Jesus motivated by zeal has no power. The Bible says, and these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name, they shall cast out devils. The sons of Siva could not cast out the evil spirit because they didn't have the capacity to believe in Jesus. Why? Because they were not born again. You must be. 
You have to be born again. You must be a child of God before you can believe in the name of Jesus and have signs that follow you. The word takes it no further. But after being beat down, broken, and stripped of their clothing, I wonder if these seven boys realized that there was something in the lives of Jesus and Paul that they were missing. I can only sit here and hope that they realize that they needed an experience far more than what they had heard about or seen. They needed their own experience. The time has come, and now is, when we need to realize the need for our own experience with the baptizer in the Holy Ghost. The days of riding someone else's coattail will not be enough. The day, the day for calling on the experience of Big Mama or your parents will not satisfy. The day for calling the preacher won't get it anymore. You may not get a hold of anybody on the prayer chain. Your mentor will be gone. I start thinking about Elisha. Like Elisha, you will follow your Elijah to Bethel, the house of God. But Elijah's Bethel won't bring you glory. You may follow your Elijah to Jericho, the place of fragrance. It may have the right smell, but Elijah's Jericho won't bring you glory. You may follow your Elijah to Jordan, the descender. You may have a vision, but Elijah's Jordan won't usher in your anointing. Like Elisha, you may be standing up with uh, Elijah when he is taken up into the glory of heaven, but that won't usher in your anointing. Like Elisha, you may even have Elijah's mantle fall uh, from heaven and rest upon you. Even that won't take you to the place that God has for you. Hear me this morning as we prepare to re-enter the sanctuary to do a new thing. It is when you remove what is between you and God's anointing. It is when you get so hungry for God that nothing else matters. It is when you pick up that mantle and call upon the Lord God of Elisha and strike the waters. It is then that you will open the door to the fullness of what God has for you. Mama's anointing may give you good memories. Daddy's anointing may remind you of the goodness and power of God. Grandma's anointing may give you Holy Ghost feel-good moments, but you must have your own anointing to be empowered from on high. You must have your own experience in the Holy Ghost. Remember the day of Pentecost. That was the day the Holy Spirit descended on the disciples. Pray right now that as we prepare to re-enter, that the anointing, that the anointing of the Holy Spirit might fall anew upon you and all who would believe. Power will come over you. Don't you be afraid or concerned about how people will react to a real move of the Holy Spirit. I can tell you how people will react to a sovereign move of the Holy Spirit. People will be saved. People will be set free. People will be healed. People will be delivered. People will become bold witnesses of Christ. The pits of hell will tremble in fear because their power will become overtaken through the authority of the righteousness of God through Jesus Christ. The church will have a voice in this nation again. Heavenly Father, let the fire of the Holy Ghost burn within your church once again. Let the fire of the Holy Ghost burn within First Baptist Church, North Indianapolis, once again. Look down upon this harvest and these labors. Give us the promise, Holy Ghost. We need another Pentecost, Lord. Send the fire. Send the fire. Send the fire. Come, Holy Spirit, in the name, in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Come right now. And the brothers and sisters of Christ said, amen. The doors of the church are open. We invite you right now. We invite you right now, wherever you may be. If you don't have a relationship 
with Jesus Christ, please contact us. It, it's on your screen. You can call Pastor Hicks. You you can call me. You can you can call the church office. We want to be your church with family. We want to love you. We because we know that God loves you, and it is not the Lord's will that any should be lost. Even as we prepare to re-enter the sanctuary, we want. We want those who really truly believe in Jesus to come new. We ask the Lord to, to clean up our flesh, to do a new thing. We're going to pray here in just a little bit on the premises of First Baptist and inside the sanctuary in the Bradley building. We're going to consecrate these grounds because we're doing a new thing, because God is doing a new thing. I'm so grateful. Won't you come right now? Won't you come right now? We love you. And we bless our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, for all that he has done, is doing, and will do. It is now time for communion. It's time for us to remember the sacrifice of God through Jesus Christ. Uh, Jesus was provided for us by a loving God, a caring God that created us and cared to see humanity move in the right direction. The word came through the prophets. Uh, but the world received the word not. Uh, God sent his only begotten son, Jesus, to provide uh, an atonement, to provide salvation from our sins. And all of us stand in need of salvation. All of us like sheep have gone astray, each one of us in our own way. But we praise God that we have an opportunity to now come to this table. We have an opportunity to come and participate in these acts that we might remember the fact that we are uh, finite and that God is infinite, that God is all powerful and we need God to survive. And so on today, we ask that you might find uh, some bread and that you might find uh, some beverage uh, that you might uh, prepare uh, where you are to uh, receive uh, this act of communion. The Bible says that uh, they were in the upper room one night it was a Thursday night, a Monday Thursday, uh, that they were in that upper room. And as they were in that upper room, Jesus gathered them and commanded their attention. He said, this is my body, which is broken for you. And he said that I'm going to lay down my life for humanity. He said, after supper, uh, this is the cup. And while the bread represents my broken body, this cup, uh, that represents the blood that will be shed uh, for the sins of humanity. And so when we remember the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the word says, as often as you do this, you show forth my death and my suffering until I shall come again. And so we remember Jesus right now. We remember his sacrifice and we say, thanks be to God. Uh, he did that just for me. Uh, we ask that you might take the bread and that you might eat. In fact, eat all of it. Uh, then take the cup and participate by drinking of the cup. Uh, these elements come to remind us of Jesus and the sacrifice of Jesus. But as we come on today, uh, we ask that you might not simply be reconciled with God, but Paul says uh, that we ought to be reconciled with one another as well, uh, that we should say, I'm sorry, and seek forgiveness for those that uh, and from those that we have offended. And so uh, on today, we ask that you might remember the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Thank God for salvation. Somebody say just for me. He thought enough of you to die for you. Take now, eat and drink all of it and live for him. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Somebody say amen. What does the cross of Jesus mean? It's more than songs we sing, much more than any emblem on your chain. But it means I'm free from the chains of slavery. And the blood he shed won't let my sins remain. Upon the cross, my Savior died. The lamb was crucified, showed us a love that this world had never known. Oh, what love divine, truer love you'll never find. So that we might live, love came 
and died alone. Oh, the cross will always represent the love God has for me. When the Lord of glory, heaven sent, gave all on Calvary, he did it just for me. Just for me. Jesus came and did it just for me. Just for me. Just for me. Jesus came and did it just for me. Oh, just for me. Just for me. Jesus came and did it just for me. And we find this benediction to be perfectly reverent. Even as we prepare to go down from this place, God, great and wise God, we thank you. And we say that now unto him, who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above anything we could ever ask or imagine to the only wise God, to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the honor, majesty, power, and dominion, both now and forevermore. Let us say amen. God bless you.